Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Thanks, Beth. Uh, okay, good evening, and thank you so much for coming to this panel event on time travel. Uh, I'm Claire Moriarty. I'm a fellow for public philosophy here at the Forum, uh, and I teach and research at King's College London. Okay, so let me introduce the panel. Emily Thomas is an assistant professor of philosophy at Durham University. She works primarily on space and time in the history of philosophy. Uh, this event conveniently marries her philosophical interests in both time and travel. Uh, she's currently writing a book on philosophical problems in travel and has a book coming out next year on theories of time in the early modern period. Her time research is supported by the Netherlands Research Council and the British Academy. Uh, Adam Roberts, to Emily's right, uh, is Professor of 19th Century Literature at Royal Holloway University London, teaching English Literature and Creative Writing. He's published many science fiction novels and stories. Uh, the Thing Itself is a science fiction rendering of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, correct? <laughs> Uh, and another Buy many copies. <laughs> Buy seven copies in case you lose six. Think how sad you'd be if you bought six copies of this novel and then lost all six. That extra seventh copy could be the, the difference. That, that, anyway. And another recent novel you should perhaps buy six or seven copies of is The Real Town Murders. That's 2017. Uh, and Brian Roberts, to Adam's right, our second Roberts, is a philosopher of physics working as an associate professor of philosophy, logic and scientific method at LSE. He does a lot of work on the nature of time. He's just won a Leverholm Prize and is co-administering a US National Science Foundation grant with a colleague in Notre Dame on the representation of observation in physics and philosophy. Okay. Right, so let's begin maybe with some introductory material. Emily, perhaps you could start us off here. So what is time travel? Why are philosophers, maybe especially uh, philosophers who work on metaphysics, interested in it? Okay, I, so hello everybody. I'm glad to see there's so many of you here. Time travel, we usually think of as a discrepancy between time and time, by which I mean a discrepancy between your time of departure and your time of arrival. So normally, if you leave at one o'clock in the afternoon, your journey takes two hours, you're going to be arriving at three o'clock. Time travel means that there's going to be a discrepancy. Maybe you're arriving at six o'clock in the evening because you've time traveled into the future. Or maybe you'll be arriving at five o'clock in the morning of the same day because you've time traveled back on yourself into the past. Right, so that's how we usually understand it, as a discrepancy between time and time. Okay. As for why philosophers care about it, we have began working on time travel seriously in the 50s and 60s. Um, and I think that was largely a result of developments in physics, which we'll hear more about, I suspect, um, which taught philosophers that perhaps we should be thinking of time as being a bit more like space. So by this time, science was happy to unify space and time as space-time, and this, I think, got philosophers really thinking about, well, in space, you can travel in any direction. You can go north or south or left or right. So why can't you do that in time too, if time is somehow really closely related to space? Okay, so does this kind of a discussion of time travel require something like a theory of time, or is that something we need to have in place? I think there are definitely big assumptions that go into any discussion of time travel. And one of the biggest, I think, is an assumption that the past and the future are actually real. Because if the past and future aren't real, then you can't travel to them. Where are we going? Yeah. Absolutely. And one of the big theories of time, known as presentism, thinks that only the present moment is real. The past is unreal. The past was real, but it ceased to be. It's not anymore. And the future will be real, but it's not real yet. In order to think that time travel is possible, I think you have to reject presentism. You have to allow that the past and the future is, are just as real as the present moment. 
Okay, so um, how does that square with the physics end of things then, Brian, is that? <laughs> um, well, yeah, so I guess from a physics perspective, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of I, restrictions on time travel uh, that have to be added to this sort of description. So it's, it's true we often think about space and time together, uh, but there are certain restrictions on how fast we can travel that you get in the same way of thinking. So, you, you know, you're not supposed to be able to travel faster than the speed of light, especially given that you start traveling slower than the speed of light. That never happens. And uh, it turns out that if, if you wanted to you sort of imagine your timeline, you know, your life traveling through time, if you wanted to sort of just turn that timeline around and just be going the reverse direction, as you could turn around in space, right? If you tried that sort of simple idea, you would have to travel faster than the speed of light. As you're tilting in this description, you are traveling faster and faster, and at some point you would cross this threshold. That's not possible. So from a physics perspective, the, sort, the sorts of time travels that we get interested in uh, aren't like that. They're not just simply turning around. And the way that was sort of uh, studied intensively in uh, following the work of, of the logician Kurt Gödel in the 20th century is, is rather more like, it's not so much like the DeLorean. <laughs> it's more like if you've seen the film Groundhog's Day, where Bill Murray wakes up in the same crappy little town again and again and again, repeating the same day over and over and over again. Not just going back to the same place, but going back to the same time. <clears throat> uh, so now th th those sorts of things require you know, space and time to sort of loop back around on itself. And having a curved space-time is something that's central to modern, the modern study of gravity. So this is a perfectly reasonable thing to happen as far as we currently understand space-time. Uh, but then there are these old, I mean, philosophers have been asking about time travel for a longer time than, than, you know, than, than general relativity has existed. Uh, and there's this old problem about the grandfather paradox, which we still face in even these descriptions. And that problem is, if you were to travel back in time uh, to a time when your grandfather was a young man. I don't know why it's always your grandfather, the poor guy. Well, because he's uh, an idiot, clearly. But what about, you know... If he's asking for it, that's why. Okay, perhaps he was... Uh, it may be that Adam's grandfather was asking for it. <laughs> Maybe it was your great-grandfather. Anyway, you go back to the time your grandfather was a young man, you kill your grandfather, and now he doesn't have your mother, your mother doesn't have you, and so you don't go backwards in time and kill your grandfather. So the seriousness of this as a philosopher is... is you know, it can't be overstated. This is a literal contradiction you just entered into your, into your description of nature. So the worst possible thing a philosopher can imagine. You, you don't believe both P and not P. Uh, so this is a real problem that we have to deal with. Various proposals are, are out there, how to structure and modify the physics in a way that sort of prevents this sort of thing. Some people say, you'll always slip on a banana peel right before you pull the trigger. <laughs> and this universe just has this special miracle built, in, built into it that you know, when you go back in time, you just sort of miss, you mess it up when you try and, and do something inconsistent. You can do other things, you just can't do anything that leads to an inconsistency. Uh, but, right, so some people think this sounds sort of ad hoc. There's, there's some further discussion about that. Uh, so there's the consistency. One question is about can we, you know, build consistency into these descriptions? And then there's this, I guess there's a further question. I mean, what I'm really interested in is not just time travel, but can I create a time travel scenario? That is, I want to make a machine that gives rise to some, you know, causal process that leads to time travel happening in the sense of, of the Bill Murray movie, uh, in, in the sense of these causal loops. And that's actually a very hard question. It's, it's been studied uh, by mathematicians and physicists and philosophers. Stephen Hawking has a paper on this. Kip, uh, Kip Thorne, 2017 Nobel Prize winner, has a paper on this. How can we uh, manipulate matter in such a way that we guarantee there will be a time travel scenario in our future? Uh, so there's some open physics questions there, some open philosophy questions, and just a great deal of interesting uh, work to be done. So. Okay, so um, from the point of view of science fiction or literature, um, have you written about murdering your own grandfather yet? I feel bad for my granddad. Well, granddad was a very nice man, a very <laughs> lovely man, and he's dead now anyway, so it would be, it would be egregious to But how did it again. happen? Unless he came back as a zombie, and then I had to kill him that way. Um, from, from the point of view... I think you'd be time-travelling back to when he was alive. Well, not if he was a, <laughs> not if he were a zombie. Would he coming out? Well, anyway, let's not get distracted. The, the, the literary angle, the science fiction angle, it's very interesting to me to hear from Emily that, that, that philosophers get interested in this in the kind of 50s and the 60s as a function of the way that the new Einsteinian physics inflects our understanding of the world. 
Literature gets interested in this in the 1880s and the 1890s and at the turn of the century, so kind of half a century earlier, which is interesting. Really, the first time travel story is H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, which was published as a novel in 1895. It was originally published as a, as a short story under the catastrophically bad title The Chronic Argonauts, in 1888. It sounds like a disease. It sounds like, oh, I'm afraid you're suffering from chronic Argonauts. But it's chronic because it's that's, that's Chronos is time and the Argonauts are the, the people who voyage through time. So Young Wells thought that was a good title. In 1888 he publishes this as a, as a short story effectively. And it's really the first time that anyone's published a story in which there is a machine that my younger and better looking uh, brother suggests he would like to invent that can take you physically into the future into the past. Before that there are lots of stories about people falling into a great sleep like Rip Van Winkle and waking up 100 years in the future. Um, I mean there's the prophecies and thinking about time that's, that's as old as humanity but the idea that you would make a machine that would take you through, that, that's invented out of whole cloth at the end of the 1880s and that's a very striking thing when you think about it, that no one had had that idea before. And then suddenly, through around the turn of the century, there is a plethora of time travel stories. And some of those are science fiction stories that to do with fancy machines that will zip you here and there. And they start addressing all the paradoxes, uh, the grandfather paradox and the, the, the by his bootstraps paradox, which is a version of that where you go back in time and become your own father. And then how could you possibly be in the world if you're the one who came back and seduced your own mother and so on. But not just in science fiction, it also becomes a feature of literary modernism in the fullest sense. So one of the arguments I make that I have no, none of my literary studies colleagues have any sympathy for is that Proust's great novel, A La Recherche du Temps Perdu, In Search of Lost Time, his great modernist masterpiece, is kind of science fiction because it's kind of all about travelling back in time to this moment that's fixed in Marcel, the narrator's memory that he has this he eats the madeleine cake and it takes him back to being a child again the whole book is stuck in this narrative loop where he really can't get past how much he loves his mother how important his grandmother was to him and that's very modern it's a very early 20th century it seems to me that the philosophers and i don't say this to be disrespectful because okay. you're very a la mode and, and <coughs> so on but it seems to me you're a little behind the curve that culturally the idea of time travel comes into general currency around about 1900, kind of 50 years before you were saying. As far as I'm aware, that's th exactly the case. Uh, yeah, no, that it was discussed yeah. in literature, but you get the odd discussion in philosophy around the turn of the century. Surely Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, eternal. So, so eternal recurrence. Someone right? should say, yeah. What? 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 It's Groundhog Day. It's, 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 it's the Groundhog Day thing. It's supposed to indicate a way of living as well. I suppose you know when you make that choice, think carefully about it because it's going to happen again and again and again. You're going to keep going around. Uh, but yeah, I think it wasn't about the physics of it. It wasn't as sophisticated, I think, as the grandfather well, consideration. I mean, I'm, I'm not a physicist, but if the if the universe is eternal, then isn't it inevitable? <laughs> Some of the Greeks made precisely that argument, yeah, oh. that everything will repeat and repeat. And you find similar worries in medieval philosophers. Uh, you also, there's lots and lots of worries about prophecy. Uh, mm. You know, what, what does prophecy mean? How is it that someone can see into the future? Uh, but as far as I'm aware, there are no serious discussions of time travel uh, um, uh, until the 50s. There's the odd one or two, but not much. So why then the 1880s for literature? Do you think there was something fundamental happening culturally or...? Uh, Machines. I mean, the, so the uh, sort of mechanical uh, engine had been invented in, in, in the decades prior leading up to this. So you're sort of imagining... Everybody's working on the flight problem at this time as well. So you had the introduction of trains, people trying to invent airplanes, uh, cars were coming soon. So sort of there was this big mechanization thing, and I suppose... That's, I mean, that's certainly possible. I, I, the short answer is I don't know. I think something big happened around then in, in a cultural sense. Um, H.G. Wells is a very fascinating figure, and I'm bound to say that because I am currently writing a, a literary biography of H.G. Wells. So I've been reading all his stuff and immersing myself in his work. And there's two things that really strike me about H.G. Wells. One is that he was, he, he was a lower middle class boy who grew up in this really rather deprived circumstances, who was able to create the, a, a global personality out of his own genius, really, as a writer and as a thinker 
as a lecturer, as a, as a speaker. He, by the 1920s, he was one of the most famous people on the planet, and that came out of nowhere. He had no breeding and no background. That's all him. And I think that has something to do with it. If you read The Time Machine, uh, the machine itself is described in only the vaguest terms, and he's not going to give you a blueprint. I'm sorry, but he's not going to say, this is how you ma make this time machine. But the one, one thing that is specified is that it has a saddle, that you have to sit on the saddle and then operate the dials to go to the past or the future, depending. And the, the time traveller decides he wants to go to the future. So he goes to the year 802,701, which is far in the future, and finds that the world is degenerated and, and that the, the, the foppish Eloy, who have become almost imbeciles, live these happy lives. And the clever but bestial cannibalistic Morlocks live under the ground. You know the story of the time machine, don't you? Yes. No. I don't want to, I don't want to teach my grandmother to suck eggs. Um, but he sat on a saddle. Now, the thing that interests me about that is the, the bicycle which seems like a humble machine. If we're talking about the, the machines of the Industrial Revolution, we're likely to think of great steam engines and, and mining equipment and vast engines of war and so on. But in a way, the bicycle is an even more important machine because it gave a whole class of people mobility that they had not had before. If you were born in 1800, the only way you get about is if you were wealthy enough to to own a horse, and that meant that if you weren't, that you stayed where you were. You were born in the village and you died in the village. Now, the railways brought some mobility, but the bicycle at the end of the century gave working class and low and middle class people the freedom to go everywhere. So Wells and his first wife used to, to leave uh, the southwest London where they lived and cycle down to Brighton and then cycle up to Kent. I mean, it's astonishing to read about, actually. I couldn't do that. And I cycle a lot, but... It just looks exhausting to me, but that, they, they didn't. They weren't in a hurry. They would take time over doing it. And I think that the mobility that that gave people is partly a literal mobility. It means you can just go down to Brighton um, cheaply. It's also a social mobility. It means you as a class are no longer confined in the way that has been historically the case. And I think those two versions of mobility feed into Wells's fantasy of the total mobility, which is you can go anywhere in time. And that's, that, I, that has something to do with it, I think. I don't, I don't know. Do you guys cycle? Yeah, yeah. In London? Yeah. Do you have a death that's wish? That's great. Um, <laughs> just uh, adrenaline junkie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you're, you're kind of on a time machine already. You just need to add the extra bits, and then you could travel in time. Uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I'd love to have a machine that just can, can go anywhere here or there. I suppose... There's a way of getting to the future along these lines if you had a fast enough bicycle. Uh, a very, very and, fast and, bicycle. Yeah, you, can't, you can't come back is the, is the catch either. So there's this phenomenon called the twin, the, the, what, what would we call it, the twin scenario, the twin effect. Sometimes people call it the twin paradox, but it's not a proper paradox from a philosopher's perspective. Uh, it's a fact. <laughs> so there's, there's this property of uh, high-speed travelers uh, that if someone were to get on a spaceship and leave, leave the Earth at very a high speed, say close to the speed of light, 99% the speed of light, and they travel for a year or so in some direction. And then they turn around again and come back, same speed. So about two years have passed in their journey. They've gotten two years older. But everyone who stayed here on Earth will have aged, say, 50 years. An extraordinary amount. All their friends are, are dead, say, now or old. Uh, and and, and that's, that's a property of special, not even general relativity, uh, which is very well studied. We have lots of, of experimental evidence for this effect. It's called time dilation. Uh, we experience it all, we're, you're experiencing it right now that there are these, um, these cosmic rays that are hitting the Earth and they splash down muons from the, from the atmosphere. These are tiny particles that have a very short lifetime. They tend to disappear quickly. And they would never make it all the way down to the Earth where we detect them unless their time had slowed down. This is sort of how we explain it. It's, we say they're, 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 the time, the little clock associated with that muon has slowed down in such a way that, well, it, it has uh, 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 a slow ticking clock. It can, it can make it that distance without disappearing. Uh, so this sort of time travel has evidence in its favor. All your friends would be dead if you did this journey. You'd be far in the future and only two years passed for you. Uh, but you could never go back again. There's not, there's not a button that would take you back. Uh, so time, time dilation takes you to the future maybe in a particular way related to our normal passage of time uh, towards the future, but not to the past. But would you want to go to the past? 
Or would you want to go? Uh, yeah. If you had a machine, would you prefer to go backwards or would you prefer to go forwards? Uh, backwards, I think. Yeah. Uh, forwards for me. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. forwards. I want to see. It says a lot about it. <laughs> I want to see. I want to see if we get to 2018 without a nuclear war with North Korea. That's one thing I want to see. I feel like a lot of people just want to be out of this time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so maybe it's a good time to pause for a few questions from the audience, if there are any. Yeah, it's not really a question, but it is more related to this thing about the bicycle. And I've often th I thought this, kind of thought about this in the past, about actually it's two things. Uh, that So mechanised forms of transport are a kind of time machine, and it's kind of a, more of a kind of perspective, sense of perspective. So if someone didn't know about this machine, for example, the bicycle or the car, and they're expecting a particular time, but actually you turn up much earlier, then it's almost like you have travelled in some way by using a machine. Another thing that's a little bit more <coughs> weirder is uh, regarding H.G. Wells. We were reading an article many years ago in a, a magazine called Paranoia, uh, I don't know if it's still going, and which had the theory that H.G. Wells was well connected with certain circles. The reason why he was able to come out with the things that he came out with, which seems quite prophetic, was because he was kind of in the know, shall we say. He's one of the Illuminati. Something, something like that. Oh, now you've given me a thesis now for my, my literary biography. Or maybe he was a time traveller. Maybe he was... There is, there is a movie called Time After Time in which H.G. Wells actually builds his time machine and he travels to 1980s Los Angeles. Uh, because he's chasing Jack the Ripper, who somehow escaped 1980s Los Angeles before him. <laughs> so, you know, it, it could have been a documentary. Perhaps it wasn't a movie after all. That explains so much about when I lived in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm of an age when I, I grew up listening to bands like Hawkwind. And I remember when I first understood that Hawkwind's Silver Machine, which I had in my head as some kind of super fast, faster than light spaceship, was just a bicycle. It's a bicycle that one of the band members had that he was really proud of, that was all silver and went really fast. Bicycles are very cool. We should talk more about bicycles in philosophy. Absolutely, we should. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I feel like Flann yeah, O'Brien has done a good job on yes. uh, bicycle he's, popularization. He's on the bicycle, isn't he? Indeed. Um, we've got one more question here in the middle. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering about each of your perspectives on the potential relationship between time travel and storytelling. Um, so I'm just going to plug myself a little bit. So basically, last year I made this sci-fi short film um, called Unstuck about uh, a, woman, a young woman who meets a man claiming to be a time traveller. Uh, so as you may guess, it was directly inspired by Slaughterhouse-Five, the Unstuck in Time thing. Um, and what I was interested in exploring in that is the idea that time travel is the ultimate form of wish fulfillment because it is one of the very few things, well, beyond time dilation, like you said, um, traveling back in the past is like one of the only things which is literally impossible as far as we're aware. Um, so the notion, so, so our kind of cultural obsession with time travel is born out of this never-ending desire to go back and change things, even though it is impossible. Um, and so, so storytelling in that respect, um, but also in the sense that our very perception of time is in a way a story. Um, in the sense that, so, so, so our kind of Gregorian calendar, you know, nine to five, 24 hour clock, that kind of thing, um, is a kind of storytelling and that it provides structure to our lives so that we don't feel atomless and unstuck from time. Um, so yeah, I was just kind of wondering whether, it's gone off, oh no, it hasn't. Um, basis or whether it's just kind of me spouting off on one. Okay, well, so we'll come to that in one second. Was there a final question behind you or just take them in a batch? Was it you? Yeah. Oh, um, do you think that there are more problems for time traveling people or living things than objects or particles, which seem a lot more realistic? Okay, thanks. So one on narrative and then one on things versus people. Thank yeah, you. maybe I, I have a comment about uh, both. Uh, maybe a one shot a little bit. Uh, so I actually first I, I see time travel as um, it's it's not good for your wish fulfillment in that it tends to restrict what you can do, insofar as it's possible, uh, and that gets worse the more complex the system is. So the second question was about if we should just talk about a single particle, or is it somehow more difficult for living things? Uh, living things are really complex. So there's there's a lot of ways uh, mm -hmm. that you can develop an inconsistency in your description, you know, that horrible paradox from the grandfather paradox, 
uh, if you're a complex system, there's a lot more ways you can do it than if you're a single particle. Uh, and the, the way that, so just to give you an idea about how um, philosophers and scientists have tried to deal with this problem, I have this uh, picture I brought actually to show you this point. I wasn't sure if anybody would ask a question like this, but it sort of helps. Uh, so you, you, you might think, I can do whatever I want. You know, I could pull the trigger on a gun, or I might have a machine that inverts a photo. So I have a photo here of a, a black and white photo of a, of a puppy. Hmm. And I might have a machine which, when I place the photo in the machine, uh, it inverts it. So you see now an inverted photo of a puppy. Black's been changed to white, and similarly with the other grays. And that's a problem in a time travel universe in that, you know, you sort of imagine this thing coming around on a loop in my, in my causal, closed causal curve scenario. Uh, what started out as something that looked uninver uninverted is now inverted, and we get a contradiction when we come back around again. It's similar to the grandfather paradox. So but the way people have tried to deal with this is to say, in such universes, fine, you can do what you want. You can invert photos. But you have an extraordinarily small number of materials available to you. And the sorts of photos you have turn out to be kind of boring. In particular, they might look like this. So I'm showing a photo that is just pure gray. But it's the particular shade of gray that if you were to invert this color, it would just stay exactly the same. <laughs> so you can put this into your photo inverter, and you get a perfectly consistent description now. You got to do what you wanted to do. But the materials were vastly restricted. So we often say about time travel scenarios that they, in order to be consistent, you have to vastly restrict what sorts of wishes you can fulfill. So does the this is, I mean, I, I've got all my philosophy out of reading science fiction, which seems to be the best way of doing it, but I've come across this idea in science fiction stories that there, uh, the theory that there is just one atom. This is why all the atoms are exactly the same size, improbably enough. This one atom lasts the whole length of the universe and then travels back in time as antimatter and then travels the length of the universe again and has done this however many trillions of times it is necessary to create all the atoms that make everything up. Yeah, that sounds just completely crazy to me. I, just, okay. I can't imagine a way that... <laughs> we'll just, but I should say, I mean... There, there's a nice, that for the record, please. <laughs> there's, a, no, it, there's lots of nice ideas in there, though. I mean, the, uh, the, the, it's true. Feynman proposed this nice perspective that if you, if you, there, if you have a, a particle moving in time, there are simply two views that you can take on that particle. On one perspective, you see a particle moving in one direction in time, and it has a certain charge. But that turns out to be, for all predictive purposes in physics, it's just equivalent to a particle with the opposite charge, which would be the antiparticle, moving the other direction in time. Uh, but this isn't the sort of scenario where you have things sort of pumping forwards and backwards and doing different things every time they go back and forth. It's sort of one description which has two perspectives associated with it. So it's really sort of a perspective on the arrow of time. That so why are all the atoms exactly the same size? Doesn't that seem They're not, time? mate. They're all over the place. Why we have a huge that? ontology of so many different kinds of particles. So they, there's big ones, small ones. You know, the Higgs has a certain mass energy. Other particles yeah, have other mass energy. All the Higgs are the, are the same size, aren't they? You mean atoms ah, specifically? All, all atoms They're of the same well, kind. So, yeah. OK, so we all have this the, giant all the ontology. All atoms are the yeah. same uh, size. Yeah, yeah. 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 That just, there's nothing else like that in nature, it seems to me. Well, I mean, we're not the same size. But we're made, yeah, okay, that's true. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. And in terms gonna, of... They're identical the, in a certain yeah. sense, that's true. So I want to go back to this motivation question. I'm not at all sure time travel stories are just motivated by the desire to change the past. I think also there's a tremendous curiosity about what the future's going to turn out to be. And in fact, that's exactly what we find in H.G. Wells. Admittedly, he's trying to teach us lessons about what the future will be <laughs> if we continue on our present course. But I, but I think curiosity is at the heart of it as well. But we just need determinism for that, don't we? to know what the future is going to be. Wow, I think that's controversial. <laughs> well, it, the, the question about stories is a really interesting one because stories are, they have to speak to our human experience. They're not, we, we don't go to stories for an overarching theory of everything. That's what philosophers are for. And our human experience, it seems to me the two different kinds of time travel story that fascinate us, stories about going into the past, uh, the, the back to the future style narrative, are stories about our anxieties about our own origins. And I, you wouldn't, for myself, I'd be tempted to read that in a kind of, as an Oedipal anxiety, that you go back and your, your mother is suddenly beautiful and sexy and you're attracted to her. And that, there's, there's something that, that collapses your, your possibility to think about that. Um, the, for me, one of the greatest science fiction time travel films is a film from 1963 called La Jetée by a French maker, filmmaker called Chris, um, not Chris Martin, that's the guy from Coldplay. <laughs> <laughs> I am Chris so impressed Mar with your cultural knowledge. <laughs> no, Chris Marker. 
it's, it's weird because it's not a French name. He is French, but he's called Chris Marker, and he made a film called La Jetée. It was remade by Terry Gilliam. Uh, it's a story about a, a future, a blasted post-apocalyptic future, and a character who keeps coming back to a particular moment when he, as a child, saw a man being shot dead at Orly Airport in, in France. It turns out that it is he himself who is being shot dead. You may have seen this movie. You may have seen the Terry Gilliam remake. So there's that anxiety, which is a kind of Oedipal anxiety, but then travelling to the future, I think, is the attempt to vault over our own death, and those are stories about our anxiety, about our own mortality, and one of the things that makes The Time Machine so very clever is only a short little novel. You could read it in an afternoon. But after he has gone to 802, 701, and met the Eloy and the Morlocks, the time traveller goes further into the future, and what he then discovers is humanity has devolved further, first of all into these huge, horrible, crab-like creatures wandering around on a, on a terminal beach where a huge red swollen sun never sets and then finally goes further and then the sun has gone and now there's just some weird black blob and that is where we're all going that's the ultimate evolution of humanity into into nothing so the clever thing about the time machine is the way it takes that fantasy that we can escape our own embeddedness in time we can escape our own mortality and it says you can't know your, the entropy is simply the way the universe is, that you'll go into the future and then not only you but everything is dying. And that, I think, is, it's not a very comforting story, but it's a very compelling story. It's interesting, yeah. So you, you see it as, as in a lot of different ways about ir irreversibility, that the universe has all these irreversible processes like death or a certain cultural end or the increase of entropy, and that's the sort of thing that doesn't, it's not symmetric under reversal of time. Yeah, so that would be right. But I also, I suppose what I'm also suggesting to the philosophers is that when you talk about how it can't be P and not P, when you talk about your, your profound intellectual aversion to the kind of paradoxes that time travel notionally throws up, actually that aversion is an Oedipal terror of the primal <laughs> scene out of which your parents sexually created you. That's, uh, that's why it has such... <laughs> that's a very useful piece of information. Yeah, it's good to know. Right. It's Thank good to know. You. Just, yes. to, just to frame your intellectual <laughs> endeavours. It's uh, wonderful. Like there's a lot of dystopian future scenarios. Do we have much, in, by the way, of utopian ones? Is, it, is there a real swing towards the negative when it comes to the way we narrativise sort of future time travel scenarios? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to hog the microphone. What am I talking about? Of course I want to hold the microphone. <laughs> Listen to me. Um, the short answer to that is the utopias had a vogue. And actually, interestingly, given what we're talking about, the, there was a resurgence of them at the end of the 19th century. It starts in the 16th century, and they're kind of constant. Future utopias start with a book called Looking Backwards by a man called Edward <laughs> Bellamy, which was completely forgotten. I don't want anyone read Looking Backwards by Edward Bellamy from 1887. In its day, it was one of the best-selling novels in the world, and Bellamy formed a political party and had a real shot at the US presidency on the back of it. Everyone read it, everyone wrote responses to it, and it's about a man who wakes up 100 years in the future in 1987 in a utopia. And Bellamy's political party was saying, well, if we just do what I say, then that's how we'll get to that utopia. And there were, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of future utopias through the 18, 80s and 90s into the 1900s, now, you're right, nowadays, nobody writes utopia anymore. Now, the whole vibe is dystopian and dark and gritty and mean. And that's a really strange shift about in, in aesthetic as to why young people nowadays, that's what they want to go to. They're, they're not interested in these, what often were quite dramatically inert utopian stories. Because a story needs conflict to generate drama, and in a utopian society, you've done away with all that. So, maybe the the shift is simply a narratological one, that dystopias tell better stories than utopias do. Not just young people. Things like Brave New Worlds at Fahrenheit 451, they've been around for a long time now. So, yes, so I'm, I'm going to bring everything back to H.G. Wells, because he is my King Charles head. Brave New World was a, a parody of H.G. Wells' utopias. H.G. Wells wrote six or seven future utopias, in which he had this vision for a world state where everything would be happy. And Aldous Huxley said, well, this is ridiculous. Obviously, it wouldn't work out that way as a specific reaction to that. Although I have to say, I've taught H.G. Wells to undergraduates, and it can be hard getting 18 and 19-year-olds to get their head around the idea that a world in which they can take as much, as many drugs and have as much sex as they like is a dystopia. It's quite hard sometimes <laughs> for them to really grasp Aldous <laughs> Huxley's dystopian 
message there. It's like, you know, what's not to like? Emily, do you have any thoughts on the difference between backwards and forwards direction then from a sort of philosophical point of view? Okay, okay, I do. So, oddly, in philosophy of time, all the discussion focuses on backwards time travel. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why, I, it, but that really is where the focus lies. Um, and if forwards time travel is discussed, it is often precisely these kinds of time dilations we were discussing earlier, which are then dismissed fairly quickly. The idea being that there's not really a discrepancy between your arrival and departure time, if we can account for it using some fairly well understood physics. So that that's just not enough of a discrepancy to count as time travel. Oh, but it is a, I like, I do, it is a, sorry to interrupt, but I do think it is a discrepancy in that you have two clocks. You have your clock on the spaceship when you travel out and come back again. And that, in Lewis's terms, this would be your internal time. Yeah. And then you have some other time parameter, which is associated with the people on Earth. And Lewis might write down space-time coordinates and call this external time. Yeah. But it's really a difference between two kinds of clocks. It is a powerful discrepancy. It's just now we accept that it's a fact, too. You know. <laughs> Some philosophers think, so of course they would agree with you, the time traveller has a personal watch, and then the watch is going to register a different time to the person who's stuck back on Earth. See, there is a discrepancy of time. But some philosophers just don't want to class that as time travel, they, because they think it's an explicable discrepancy. I think that's probably what's going on. Uh, what they're more interested in uh, is inexplicable discrepancies, so jumps back into the past that we can't explain or understand using our current physics. Um, and I wonder if the reason philosophers don't discuss backwards time travel as much is just uh, forwards time travel as much as backwards time travel is just because thinking about the future as real is stranger than thinking about the past okay. as real. Right, so we all know that there are facts about the past. Dinosaurs existed at such and such a time. There was the fall of the Roman Empire. And we think of the were past... Were those two things connected? <laughs> I think they were, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Revisionary a much history. better story than the actual story, <laughs> was not it? Tyrannosaurus Rex is <laughs> With Julius rampaging Caesar. through Rome. <laughs> I agree. I'm sorry, I tried to... <laughs> <laughs> that was good. As a Leibnizian, I believe you are committed to that. Right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I'll accept that. Yeah. <laughs> Where on earth was I going with this? <laughs> so in my I head, I just have dinosaurs eating Leibniz. I would <laughs> say that it's interesting, and I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't use the word fetish. I wouldn't suggest that physicists make a fetish out of clocks, because that would sound a bit insulting. And you're sitting quite close to me, and you might <laughs> hit me. But there is, clocks are not a fact of the universe, clocks are historically and culturally determined things, and it goes back to where we started in this discussion in a way. The clocks, there have been clocks for a long, long time, but the search for accurate clocks that will properly measure time in a way that can be globalised is a function of the 19th century, and it's a function to go back to the question that was asked earlier. It's about travel, it's about railway timetables, about linking together communities that wouldn't normally be linked together. As the te technologies of travel become more rapid, it becomes more important that we're all working to the same clock. So that's an 18th and a 19th century phenomenon in a way. Well, I, so I'm using the words, one should be more general in the notion of clock that when one describes these sorts of time dilation scenarios, it's not just the mechanical clock that slows. Your pulse is a clock in the same sense, that slows. You could have a continuous hourglass, you could have water flowing through a pipe and filling it. Any process you can imagine will slow down all in exactly the same way when you put it on the spaceship. So it's not something that you detect when you get on the spaceship. Why? Because everything has slowed. What could you use to compare and, 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 and find that you know, your clocks have slowed down? You couldn't take one clock and compare it to the other because they both slowed, so they still, they're still in sync. Uh, so it's, it's clock in a much more general sense. We're talking really just about processes. Uh, everything slows when one, when one is in relative motion with respect no, to the and, other. And I'm not denying the physics of it, but I'm mm -hmm. suggesting that your pulse obviously speeds up or slows down. Your sense of how time is passing, we've all had this experience. I have kids, for them a year is an eternity. And for me, I can't believe it's not still 1979. It's still very hard for me. <laughs> that was last year? Was it the year before last? <laughs> no, it's a good point. I mean, so there, are, there is this further question of how the psychological experience of time couples to physical processes like the motions of particles in space. And, mm. but what's, and what's dilating in th this description, in the Einsteinian description, is not, we're not really making a claim about the psychology. You know, you, you may just be terrified because you're on a, on a spaceship, but 
if we consider, for example, by dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But look, look at any physical process associated with you, even your cell metabolism. Every little bit of you will have, have slowed in just the same way. But do you think that the kinds of time slides into the future that you get with time dilation is the same as cycling and jumping into the future that we get in the time machine? Well, there, so I thought about what you might mean when you said that jumping thing. Uh, I could think of two different sorts of things you could say. Um, one would be sort of a discontinuity where I, I, you know, forget about humans, you know, just imagine a single particle moving and then there, the, the particle stops existing and I look at some later time and I see now this particle start existing. And I would say, I think this is a particle that's now traveled in time. But I think your identity question is sort of insightful here. I mean, there's this interesting question now. How do you know those are one and the same, really? And why not just say there was a particle that disappeared, and then there was a particle that appeared? Absolutely. So it's hard for me to tell that that's, that counts as time travel, really. Uh, I, I want to see... Because you'd want to see other kinds of identity conditions. So something else that's going to guarantee that this particle and that particle is the same. Yeah, I would want to know what it, in what sense it's the same. Often, you know, we describe things as being the same because there's a certain continuity associated with them. Yeah. Parfit is famous for this view. Uh, we have continuous psychological experiences from childhood to adulthood, and this is what makes you the same person as that child who had totally different beliefs and, frankly, a different skeleton as well, right? More hair. More hair, yeah, more hair or whatever. Uh, so we could say a similar thing about particles, it's something about their, their continuity. But they're not sentient, they're not conscious. Fair enough. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> it, it, it agrees. I mean, so I, I read a lot of Kant because I wrote this <laughs> science fiction novel based on Kant, and Kant says time and space, they're not out there in the universe. They're structures of our perception of the thing itself, whatever the thing itself is. That's not, it's not marked by a clock or anything like that. That's and true, that, yeah. That's why you, you can't perceive time directly. You can only perceive the effect time has on your receding hairline. You can't. I mean, this is, it, it is a radical view, though, this view. I mean, so, so Kant is taking really almost every, so this is the, the, the idealist tradition in which you take everything that's in sort of common language you'd say is in the external world, like this table. And it's, you, you, know, you now reinterpret all that stuff where you say it's not really in the external world. Well, no, it is. It's just it's not a table. Well, not, what, I mean by the yeah, yeah. what I mean by the external world, then, is that uh, I, I am having certain sorts of experiences which are structured in certain ways. And it's really mental stuff more than external stuff that the table consists in. Uh, yeah, that depends on what kind of idealist you are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable with that characterization. Okay. Of so it. the way, the way it, it was explained to me was uh, you can imagine an object, let's say in space or in time, growing older or existing in space, and you can imagine that object being taken away. We can all do that. But you can't imagine space itself being taken away because that's not a feature of the universe, that's part of how we're seeing things. You can't think outside that because that's what structures our thoughts. Oh, so that's very much Kant's own take. All right, so I'm earlier... glad I got that right then, because <laughs> you know, very cross with me. Agreed. Earlier thinkers, so people like Isaac Newton back in the 17th century, they thought exactly the same thing, that I can imagine all the stuff in this room, all the tables, all the chairs, all the people being deleted from existence, but I can't imagine space and time not existing. Now, Newton took that to mean that space and time must really exist. They must really be necessary features of the universe, that they're something that you just can't delete. And, and then Kant's twist on that is, well, sure, you can't delete them, but the reason for that is that they're in our heads. They're just yeah. part of our very fundamental makeup. So there is something out there, and Kant calls that the, the unsick, the thing itself, and we interact with it, we perceive it. But the, the spectacles that we're wearing to perceive it are time and space flavoured, coloured spectacles. So all the stuff that, whatever it is, we can't access it directly. We can only access it through our perceptions. And the way we perceive it is through time and through space. And if that's true, then a lot of this speculation becomes a question about how our minds work, rather than atoms and spaceships in the world. Yeah, but, but I mean, I, I, I find this whole discussion, it's very close to psychosis in a way, you know, you're sort of saying, <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe in the stuff that's out there, you know. And, and in fact, really with Kant, you do, you're not supposed to know any, you don't really know stuff about what's out there. He has these strange proofs that the external world exists, but that one doesn't know anything about it. So it's sometimes called epistemological uh, uh, idealism. Uh, but 
I, I think what's dangerous about these sorts of view, these sorts of views, is that they they are drawing an inference about space and time on the basis of what we can and can't imagine. Because I couldn't imagine space disappearing, but our imaginations are extraordinarily limited. <laughs> you know, I mean, nobody thought of time travel until H.G. Wells in the 19th century. <laughs> and I mean, from my perspective, there's a certain sense in which space gets deleted every time a black hole forms and a singularity develops. There's, a, there, there's not a there's not a cent, you know there's not a central point to the black hole. This is a sort of breakdown in, in the description of physics, and there is no place or time associated with its center. It is simply a singularity. Uh, and I think if someone said, no, 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 but that's not possible because I can't imagine deleting space, I would think they were simply not being imaginative enough. And, and nature no, really yeah. is just much more imaginative than we are, so well, that, best to pay attention to it. I, mean, that's, I don't, I, I, actually, I'd agree with that, although it is an article of faith to say nature is more imaginative than we are. And I'm not here to plunk my novels, although you should buy seven <laughs> copies of every title that I publish. But the premise for this novel I wrote, The Thing Itself, which is a Kantian science fiction novel, is it starts with the idea that we develop AI, a computer intelligence, that is sophisticated enough to be intelligent, <laughs> but is not structured in the way that our minds are structured. And that if we had that, and it's not hard to imagine that such a thing could happen, then we could triangulate on <laughs> the thing itself. We could, we'd have our perception of it, and we'd have some third party's perception, which isn't limited by our perceptions. And if we could do that, then suddenly everything becomes possible. And then it has to be a science fiction novel, so then it becomes <coughs> having direct access to the thing itself means you can alter space and alter time and travel in time and do all these things that you say you can't. But it's, I mean, I, the point about us being limited, I mean, I'm more limited than most, but it doesn't necessarily <coughs> have to be that way, does it? <laughs> it does. How, how I much just, of Kant do you think is right about this? Well, when I started, I, I knew Kant mostly through second hand, <laughs> and I'm going to sound like I've joined a cult, but actually reading Kant really persuaded me and has turned me kind of into a Kantian. I know it's very unfashionable, and Leibniz is much hipper, and Leibniz is much, much more science fictional, actually. And the, the something about the, there's something. Every single science fiction novel or story is its own little monad, its own little world that's been created out of nothing. It's not that's trying to represent it. our world. I ought to be more of a Leibnizian, but... Yes, and his work was once described as a fairy tale, but which right. would be appropriate, perhaps, with the I science think, fiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I went into reading Kant thinking he was saying, oh, it's just all in our heads, we just kind of all make it up, which is close to psychosis, you're right. I don't think he is saying that at all. I think he's very firm that there is a thing. And I think he thinks it's God, because he's, he was religious. He was an unconventional Christian, but he was kind of a Christian. But he thinks that this is, these are the materials that God has given us to perceive God. Uh, the, the spectacles that are time and space spectacles, and all the other, the 12 categories of things like causation and, and so on. Um, and it's, it's, it's beautifully worked. It all fits together like a clockwork machine, and it's, it's quite... It, it doesn't does. persuade you, though, as a professional philosopher. It doesn't persuade me, but it is nonetheless an extremely well-reasoned so why, why position. Is, can you say quickly why Kant's wrong? Because then it could disabuse me. He thought too. space was Euclidean, you know? Space is not Euclidean. And moreover, that was meant to be synthetic a priori. I mean, this is a guy who regularly is just inward-looking and then drawing inferences about things that properly should be understood experimentally. But we know space is non-Euclidean by experiments. Experiment. are also inward-looking. That's his whole point. So Fair there's enough. no way of stepping but, but, outside. Yeah, so maybe let me revise. Uh, however you interpret it, uh, the methodology of science, of presenting evidence and devising te you know, testable scenarios to inform your views, that it's just much more reliable than Kant's strategy for understanding space. To be space. fair to Kant, <laughs> had he known about any of the stuff we know now, I think he might well have developed his views in different ways. He was but really he into science. A priori knowledge. I mean, a priori knowledge is a powerful claim, right? It's supposed to be, you know something independently of what happens in your, you know, external ex experience of the external world. So it's prior to experience, you have knowledge. So it shouldn't matter that you experience, you know, the facts and experiments of general relativity. His claim was that space is Euclidean. And th this is a sign to me of a sick view. <laughs> it's, it, uh, it was tested, Kant's view, in a way, and it was found wrong. Kind of, but kind of not. We're in a Euclidean space now. At certain, if you push, I'm not. If you <laughs> push it to a certain, if you, if you push space as far as it will go, it turns into weird Einsteinian curvature and so Seems on. Seems very unfair to, to take Kant to task for uh, failing to be aware of a geometry that wouldn't obtain for a further 
Why Jesus then did he call it opera? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Nineteenth century <laughs> phenomenon here, not a hood. But but the the why why if he calls it a priori, why shouldn't I take him to task? He said it's prior to experienced knowledge, and then we say ah, oh, but he didn't have the same experiences as, uh, as us. But by his own lights, that shouldn't matter. He was attempting to solve problems that he found in space and time between Newton and Leibniz. It's a product of his period. I, okay, I think... good, good. So as long as we, yeah, I'm happy to relegate him to like the, the historical role that he played. He was very influential, I think it's fine. But the views on, on my current standards I find just unsatisfactory. I don't think he would have believed in time travel, I will say that. No, I think, I think that's right. <laughs> Okay, so maybe now would be a good time to break for some audience <laughs> questions. <laughs> Let the stage cool down. Oh, yes. Okay, hands high. Okay, we've got one in the front here, then one here, and then one here. So we'll take three together on that kind of work. Uh, hi, I think my question is maybe about the nature of time. So could you explain um, why does time go in one direction? Why isn't it naturally going backwards? Um, is it like, I think it's to do with entropy, but or something. <laughs> I don't know the details. And also, why, <laughs> why time travel obviously has never been invented, because we've never seen people from the future. Okay, so we'll come uh, back Where to are all the time second. travelers? That's such a great question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, how does he know? Ah, <laughs> uh, good point. Uh, they would have said. <laughs> so we'll just try and take, <laughs> try and take two more questions just before we address them all in a batch. So, one here. Hello. Um, I was thinking about like the physics aspect, if we like combine some ideas, because you guys started talking about thinking about time in terms of space. And then I just thought about like if we think of like quantum jumps and take it, make it like a Schrodinger's sort of experiment. And we think like take the micro into the micro into the macro and sort of try to like elaborate like if we assume that the, part, the identity problem doesn't exist and just take the quantum jumps and then take like, turn it into like a macro scale. And maybe we think like, I was thinking what that scenario could look like. Maybe we're always like jumping, like a, a multiple world scenario type of thing, multiple universe scenario. I'm not sure like, um, but expressing it, but like, I just wanted your ideas. And if someone has thought about that, like in the Schrodinger's, like Schrodinger thought, Okay, and then just behind you, maybe three to the... Yeah. Um, this is about future time travel. So if we had the machine that we could time travel to the future, um, do you think the machine would travel faster than the speed of light? So for us, we wouldn't age that much, but on Earth, it would go so many years past. Or do you think we would time travel to a point in time that the future doesn't exist, so we're just in like an empty void, but we have to wait for time to catch up to actually be in the future? <laughs> Okay, I'm okay. going to take yeah. the first question <laughs> and leave the others for you guys. So, okay, on the issue of time direction, it's really controversial. Right, so we all seem to experience a time direction, uh, you know, a wedding in the future becomes present and then it becomes past. We seem to be moving into the future. Um, some people think that's because there really is a direction in time. Right? So there is this thing called the passage of time, uh, and that is just a fundamental feature of reality. Right? That, that just is something about the world. Other people think that this is just a product of our psychological processes, right? that if we could get out of out of the, the kind of Kantian things that are drilled into our brains, um, that we would just not perceive this feeling of passage anymore. You might think that time is directional in virtue of processes within it. Uh, so you might think that entropy is a one-way directional process, um, and then you would be explaining um, our experience of the seeming single direction of time in virtue of things that have a direction in it. That would be one way. And um, as for where all the time travelers are, I, there's some really great philosophical literature on this when they talk about how uh, the time travelers are just hiding their tape recorders under their togas. <laughs> like, uh, if only we looked hard enough, we might find them. Right, but in general, that. They've all been that, eaten by dinosaurs. They've all been eaten by dinosaurs. I think that's also the problem. <laughs> Right. In general, though, this has seemed to be an objection to the possibility of time travel. Because, as you say, surely if there were time travellers amongst us now, they just wouldn't be able to keep it secret. But then science fiction would say, I mean, this is the, one of the standard 
strategies that science fiction writers use to address the grandfather paradox Brian was talking about. You can go back in time and you can kill your grandfather, but then you set a, f a different timeline. And we're all familiar with this idea, that there's a huge sheaf of different timelines. You can travel back in time, but you don't go travel traveling back into the time that we're in. And this is the many worlds stuff. Uh, many worlds, yes. I, oh, why, precisely this idea <laughs> is sometimes cashed out that way. Um, mm. the, what happens when you go back in time and kill your grandfather is that you set off into a new branch of reality. Right? Sometimes it's explained in that way. That isn't precisely the many worlds theory, which I will allow you to... <laughs> uh, I don't have anything to say about many worlds, really. I, I just feel I live in one universe, not many. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we could get some comment on either of the two questions. So. Uh, one on maybe scaling up from something like quantum level. Is there anything to be so, done there? Yeah, and then so maybe one about jumping too far. As I understood that question, at least I had a thought about that question, so I don't know if it'll answer it completely. But uh, I, I, it is interesting that uh, particles, in a sense, are way down the line from what's fundamental in physics. You sort of, when, you, when you're developing quantum theory, you develop a lot of stuff, and it's not for a while that you, <laughs> you, you finally see particles coming out. So these turn out to then be these rather ephemeral objects. Particles decay, and that means that whereas you once had a, a particular particle, a kaon, say, uh, after a certain time, you don't have a, that particle anymore. It's not there, and what you have instead are three pions. And that sort of, that sort of process is happening all the time, uh, that you had a particle, and then you don't have the particle again. Now, I guess I was imagining uh, some, some, some scenario that oscillates. These are really interesting processes, and they're important in physics, uh, where you'll have a well-known example is called k-on oscillation. You'll have a k-on that decays into another particle, which is called the anti-k-on. And that anti-k-on will then decay back into a k-on. So you have this back and forth and back and forth. But one, one feature of the description is that you have a k-on for a while, and then you don't have a k-on. And then you have a k-on again, <laughs> and then you don't have a k-on. So it maybe is a bit like that, uh, what you were asking for, this, you know, the particle's not there, and then, it, uh, and then it is there, and then it's not there, and then it is there. Um, there is something continuous about that, though. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the evolution of the, of the field, of the quantum field, is, is continuous in time. That, that, that thing's not... Um, uh, uh, discontinuous. Discontinuous, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was my only thought about that, is that, yeah, maybe it's a way of describing future time travel naturally. Yeah. And I, I talked about the idea that you could travel into the future and find there's nothing there. You have to wait for time to catch up. That is a really brilliant idea, which I'm quite tempted to steal and write a science fiction story about. But then you could sue me for breach of copyright, because it's clearly your idea. And, and well, record the, it, too. The <laughs> idea is, it's all on tape, so I have no stand-up. The idea that... As Emily was saying at the beginning, the idea that if we can travel into the future, the future must somehow be there, in the same way that you can't travel to France unless France is actually there for your plane to land on when you get the other end. That's kind of taken for granted. But imagine if it weren't that way. Imagine if you travelled into a future that hadn't happened yet and you just had to sit there in your own little bubble of time travel whatever until the rest of time caught up with you and you just got older and older and older. And by the time time caught up with you, you were as old as you would have been if you'd gone the long way around. That's a really clever idea for a story. Are you interested in writing science fiction stories? <laughs> I I can buy the idea off you for a dollar. <laughs> so I don't have any American currency in me, so that's... Uh... The story with this narrative involving a bicycle comes out soon. Yeah. We'll all know what happened here this evening. There's a wonderful story by Ian Watson called The Very Slow Time Machine, which is premised on the idea that you can travel back in time, but you can only travel back in time one minute per minute. So there's this guy stuck in this, in this kind of bath escape. And you can see him through the windows, and he just gets older and older and older as he goes back 20 years. You're thinking, why would you want to... If you could go back 20 years, but you would yourself be 20 years older, so I'd be 70, and I'd be back in... Well, actually, I, I, know, I know. What was 20 years ago? 90s. No. 80s, I think you mean. I'm afraid so. Oh, good grief. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be 70 in the 90s. That'd be a terrible thing to do. I'd be much too old to go <laughs> raving or whatever it is to do. Uh, <laughs> okay, so maybe we could talk about specific challenges facing people writing about time travel. So you have both written about the history of science fiction in a way that <laughs> you might describe as some sort of potted history of time travel stories, but also written about it yourself. So are there some unique challenges maybe facing people who want to tell those kind of stories? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the question that was, that was asked earlier. I do think there is 
a difference between those stories that are fascinated by the paradoxes that physicists talk about that can become kind of puzzle box stories where everything fits neatly together in a certain way that provide a certain sort of satisfaction. But it, that's a different kind of thing from the stories that really connect with us. Groundhog Day is a really great film, not because it has interesting things to say about the physics of time travel, but because it speaks to our daily experience. Every morning we have to get up and brush our teeth. And There was a, a, a Regency dandy who committed suicide in 1818, and his suicide note was, all this buttoning and unbuttoning. <laughs> and you kind of understand what he means. It's like, oh, we've got to go through this again and again and again. And that feels like you're trapped in a temporal loop. You're not, because you're getting older and your hair's getting thinner and so on. But that's your experiential... Well, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, I think. Of, I think there is a, a, a weird, queasy, quasi-sexual, eatable thing going on in a lot of into-the-past time travel stories that give them their, their charge. I mean, often that's then played for laughs, as is the case with Back to the Future, another very great film, it seems to me, that they make comedy out of that, but comedy, as Freud says, comes out of our anxiety, and the anxiety here is about incestual sexual desire and the figure of the mother, and I think there is something to do with mortality that is, informs future, travelling into the future stories. And I think to tell the stories in the best way, in the way that connects best with your reading audience, it, you need to understand that about them. You said, oh, uh, so you said that you weren't so keen on the stories where everything fits together neatly. Mm. I, that made me think of The Time Traveller's Wife. Have you read that? I have, yes. Okay, I see that seems to, how many of you have read that, The Time Traveller's Wife? And there was a movie. Oh, not enough. And there was a movie, yeah. yes. <laughs> did, hey, did you like that? Did you? I didn't see the movie, I've only read the book, no, but, but, but like I liked the, the book enormously, yeah. yeah. Like, and it's very much one of these time travel stories where it, everything fits together. You have a vague idea of how the end is going to be because you've already seen it foreshadowed in the first part of the book. Uh, I think that connects with so us. I, I think it does, but I also think there's... And I don't, I don't, I'm not here to diss this novel, which was vastly more successful than anything I've ever published. So that would, that would just sound like sour grapes. In, in a way, it's not, it's not to criticise the novel. I think when I read it, what struck me was these weird, creepy scenes where this guy in his 40s is effectively glomming onto this tiny young girl, saying, we are meant to be together. We are, this is our great relation. Thinking there's something horribly paedophilic about that. And it's, a, it's a story that excavates that slightly unpleasant, predatory, nasty side to the, the, the ideal of timeless love. That, that wasn't how you read it. <laughs> well, there's more to the novel than that. But there is a fair bit, a bit more weird. to the, Yeah, those scenes are a bit weird. I grant you that fully. I, but there is a lot more. I, you know, and yeah. then she's waiting her entire life because she knows at some point there's a future visit from him waiting in her future timeline. I thought stuff like that was very clever. Uh, yeah, except I, and I sad. Well, no, it's not sad. No, it's no, just no I mean the, sad in the sense of uh, unhappy sad. Oh, OK. Uh, well, you may be that. I don't know. Um, um, the I mentioned the, the, there's a the Robert Heinlein story called By His Bootstraps, which I think is the, the ne plus ultra of that kind of time travel story. It's a short story, it's about a character, and through the various contortions of the plot, this character goes back in time and has sex with himself, because uh, he's changed gender, <laughs> and births himself <laughs> so that he can then go back in time. And it's a way... For Heinlein, who was a good writer in lots of ways, but a very kind of strange right-wing libertarian masculinist individual, to come up with this myth whereby he can, he can cut himself out of those horrible causal webs of connectivity that link us to other human beings. You can stand, you can leap fully armed from the head of Job and dare you are, and you owe nothing to anyone. And that also seems to me, I mean, it's neat. It's a very neat, has anyone here read that story? No. They're making a big budget movie of it, so it'll be on the screens in 2018, apparently. I mean, it's neat that it's consistent. You know, there's no, yeah. there's no logical inconsistency of the previous kind we were discussing. Except where does he come from? Well, I mean, what so one would often short say... Short circuits cause and effect. Yeah, it? so this is, it's a common question on, on closed time-like curves. It's an example of a closed time-like curve. People do another example where you've got a painting of a rose, 
and you, you received this from your grandfather, and he said, I want you to learn how to paint by perfectly copying this rose. And so you copy the rose, and then you build a time machine. You go back in time to before your grandfather knew how to paint, and you say, young man, I'd like you to learn how to paint. Here is a painting of a rose. Copy it perfectly, which he does, and then he gives it to you, okay, and it just keeps going on this loop. And you want to ask, which rose is it? You know, what's the original painting of? But there, there, is, there is no such rose. And it happens in time travel universes that are ordinary. You, you would expect this, really. I'm calling it a causal loop. Of course, our ordinary intuitions about causation break down here. So it doesn't, there doesn't have to be an origin. It, it is a perfectly consistent story. Uh, it's just looping. But I think, I mean, I, maybe I would like to see physicists struggle with this question. I feel there might be story. You could tell me as a storytelling expert. I wonder if there's storytelling potential here. I, suppose I wanted to guarantee such a loop came into existence. This is what we normally mean. If you just read, you know, physics literature, a Kip Thorne time machine, they're basically asking, can I set up a scenario where I'll guarantee sometime in the future one of these looping scenarios will exist? And just think about what guarantee would mean. You would, you would expect there would be some causal process. Where you could sort of draw a line, you know, these, the matter is moving and moving and moving, and then it ends up, you know, hitting something that causes this, this loop. But that loop has this character that it's, as you say, it's fully independently defined. The man doesn't have to describe anything about humanity or anything like that. He can define his own existence just through this weird circular birthing. So how, how can one guarantee that, that such a scenario exists? And so we struggle with that problem in various complex ways. We want to set up a scenario so that, you know, it might even not be deterministic. Maybe there's lots of different things that could happen, but in every one there's some sort of looping scenario. But that's the sort of thing, yeah. I don't know if it's possible, but a lot of people are interested in this question. It, it, it does speak, I think, to the question we had earlier about why, where are all the time travelers? Because it could be that time travel is itself this... They're stuck in a loop. Yeah, that's my answer to that. So yeah. that's the story. <laughs> I mean, I, I love the Terminator movie. I think Terminator movie is a great movie. But in a way, Terminator 2 is a cleverer movie because Terminator 2 takes the idea that this robot has come from the future to the past to kill John Connor's mother. And it says the reason it was able to do that is because the technology inside the robot from this future time travel world enables us to develop the time travel technology that it's then able to use to come back to us. And that's very, it's neat. It's, it's narratively satisfying, but it's also existentially quite puzzling because you, part of me thinks in such a universe, if we are, and you don't like the many world universes and I'm, I don't want to agitate you. <laughs> um, but in such a universe, you might think universes in which time travel is possible become sealed off in their own short circuit. And that we happen not to be in one of those timelines. In our timeline, time moves from past to the future, and that's just how it is. If we ever develop timeline, uh, time travel, then we would, it would bud off. It would be like a... a, a, a it would branch. It would branch, branch from our timeline. But it wouldn't branch in, the, in a linear way. It would branch in a way that, that recurred back upon itself. It would become a, its own little recursive groundhog day. <laughs> We're going back over the same films. They're all films from the 80s as well, which is so true. Looper? That, that's a more recent example of yeah. a loop. I suppose it's a 100-year anniversary of H.G. Uh, Wells, so it's sensible that it be. Yeah. So we've looked at the kind of pressures time travel stories put on things like physics. What about sort of more social issues? So you've got examples maybe of Ms. Octavia Butler's Kindred, something like going back to explore different social periods, different for race, gender, this kind of thinking? Do you think time travel stories can be valuable in that way for allowing a sort of modern voice to investigate uh, a different period or notions of progress, something like this? The, the short answer <laughs> is yes. So that really we all travel experientially in our heads when we remember stuff and we go back and sometimes that's an anxious process and we go back and think, oh, why did I do this? Why did I say that? Well, how would things have worked out differently? And then we're inventing our own alternate realities in our, in our heads. History is a, a larger social version of that. That's the, it's where we've all come from. What would happen if, could you go back and kill Hitler? Would that be a good idea to go back and kill Hitler? So I don't know. The, the, do you know, I once interviewed an undergraduate who I hope isn't listening, and, and we asked her, uh, she's probably here, <laughs> and we asked her about time travel, um, and we said, what would you do if you had a time machine? And she said, I would go back and shoot Hitler in the face. 
In the face. Yeah. Yeah. Like, That's nice. Okay. <laughs> it was very specific. It was my, a good my youngest is going through his Harry Potter phase. He's, he's mad for Harry Potter. He's ten. Uh, he loves it, and that's great. Uh, another novel that's done vastly better than any novel of Brian ever has. Vastly really. better than most. Well, it's very good. I, mean, I really love the Harry Potter universe. But one of the problems in the world building of that universe is, in the Prisoner of Azkaban, you discover they have time machines. They have time turners that you can spin around and go back in time. And instead of going back to kill Hitler, or in their universe, to go back and kill Voldemort when he's still young Tom Riddle. I hope I'm not spoiling the story for people. You all know Harry Potter. Yes, no, exactly. Instead of doing that, Hermione uses it to get extra homework in because she's such a swat. It seems like a missed opportunity. Uh, but isn't there there's inbuilt limits to them? Well, I'm so sure yeah, in subsequent novels, J.K. Rowling addressed this, and she's, she's good on this because she listens to her fans, and they say, well, why don't they just... You'd have to turn the time turner... 10,000 times or something, but you could go back and kill Tom Riddle and then there'd never be a Voldemort and everything would be alright. And she says, oh no, no, the technology doesn't work that way, you can only go back a certain number of hours. And then she puts this enormous stage show on called The Cursed Child, in which apparently you can go back years and years and years. But only with very special so I have a different theory, and it's not J.K. Rowling's theory, and it's not explicit in the novels. I think what happens is the wizards have tried this I think they've used the time turner and gone back in time and killed Tom Riddle when he's only a schoolboy, and that that leads to a worse eventuality. So they've gone back and tried different things. They've gone back and tried to educate Tom Riddle or to, to change the lords of magic or whatever, and every time they try and do it, it ends up worse. That the story that we have in Harry Potter is the best timeline that they could engineer using this time technology. And it's not perfect, because lots of people die and there's a lot of suffering, but it's better than all the others. And that they've, using time travel technology this way would enable you to pick and choose. You could say, maybe shooting Hitler in the face leads to an even worse present. So the present we're at, which doesn't seem terribly good, I have to admit, maybe it's the best of all possible it worlds. Is. Everything comes back to 18th century it does. thought, doesn't it? That's With though. I know, exactly. With regard to history versus time travel stories, so you might think one advantage of looking back at the past through time travel stories rather than just through history books uh, is that time travel fiction allows you to build really complex thought experiments. Like say thought experiments unlike normal science experiments that take place in labs or particle colliders take place inside your heads. And, and one advantage of running them through books is that you can build up such layers of subtlety and complexity and, and so that might make it a lot easier for us to put ourselves in the shoes of someone wandering around in the 16th century than just reading a history book, right? Because mm. the thought experiment is so much more immersive. I think, I think that's right, but I also have a... I think there's a wrinkle, which is that we... If you look at historical fiction, which is a wonderful genre of writing, and I read a lot of historical novels, they do seem to clump around certain historical periods and not others. So we get endless... Elizabethan and Tudor stories, we get endless 19th century um, Jack the Ripper, Misty London stories, we get endless World War II stories fighting the Nazis. <coughs> Excuse me. Where we have an entire globe and 10,000 years of history that doesn't get told. That suggests to me, sorry, um, <coughs> the. Uh, that sounds like a problem. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds like we're fascinated with certain things. And not with Not with history things. as such, not with the possibilities yeah. of the thought experiment. I think that's true. But maybe one advantage of doing it as a time travel fiction book rather than just historical novels mm. is that the time traveller is usually from our time. And so they're going to share all of our social mores and preferences. And, and maybe that makes it <coughs> easier for us to see what's strange and what's familiar mm. in the past. Maybe we could take a few questions again. So I know there's one here and there's one in the back. I'm absolutely fascinated by the fact that we've all, you've all been talking about how really interested we all are in these logical impossible stories that we know <coughs> pretty well that a lot of this is logically impossible. It just cannot be because of all the paradox and nobody seems to have solved that and yet we're still interested. What I want to know is how close have philosophers got now to trying to explain whether it might be possible to travel back in time um, given what we know about the science but um, 
are there any reputable philosophers who think it is possible to travel back in time? Okay, thanks. We're just going to take a batch, so the very back of the glass is not up there yet. Hi, so my question was about uh, when you gave all the different scenarios and, and, the scenario, and the scenario that we have in Harry Potter, the one that we actually read is the best one. How do we actually test and understand all then decide which one to keep and which one not to keep. Does that mean that we split into different universes or that we have to we'll see what happens and then come back to it later? So just understand the which scenario you end up in based on which one Okay, thanks. And then just in the middle. Um, so you know how there's like the idea of the cyclical nature of time and that you have like this random loop that you just keep going and going. Um, so if we if we potentially could travel to the end of this loop slash the beginning of the next loop, um, would the whole world exist exactly the same as it did before, or would it be a slight change like in your eternal recurrence loop? Thanks very much. Okay, so you've got three questions there. Uh, one on any reputable philosopher willing to say we're pretty close. Uh, so, so, shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So there are, yes. <laughs> um, if you're after the latest thing on it, there's a book coming out by Nick Effingham. He's a, um, a professor at Birmingham on time travel. And then he details exhaustively uh, the possibilities and not. One simple way of solving the paradoxes is just to deny that there are paradoxes. So most of the paradoxes oh, oh. revolve around changing the past. If you think that time travel doesn't involve changing the past, it then you've eliminated a lot of the paradoxes. So one way, this is the banana peel stuff, Say the paradox with killing your grandfather seems to be, on the one hand, you obviously didn't kill your grandfather because you're alive, you came into existence. On the other hand, you can go back in time through time travel and pull the trigger. So it seems like you can and can't kill your grandfather. And um, you might simply think that changing the past is impossible, that events in the past are always going to conspire to prevent you from doing it. So you're always going to slip over a banana peel. A twig is always going to hit your rifle at the right moment. And then, and then there's no paradox. So that would be one way of allowing for the logical possibility. But I think, so uh, when I assign this question to students, I often ask them in particular to clarify what they mean by the word possible. When we ask, is it possible, we often mean an extraordinary number of things by that. So a philosopher might be interested, in this case, we're talking about sort of, is it logically possible? Logically. Oh, okay, logically possible. It could be permissible, of course. Possible sometimes means, am I allowed to do that? Or it could be physically possible. Uh, from the perspective of a physical possibility, there's a, there is, um, again, we're, we're centrally interested in this looping s scenario. Uh, and some eminent people have argued that it is possible. One of the first was, uh, I mean, a, a philosopher, mathematician, and scientist, uh, Kurt Gödel, who's responsible for some of the weirdest theorems in the 20th century. He's responsible for the incompleteness theorem. So the very same guy uh, uh, who argued that there are some things that are true that cannot be proven. He also uh, found a solution to Einstein's field equations. It's a possible space-time, physically possible according to Einstein's theory, uh, which at every point has one of these loops passing through it. Uh, he thought, this seems like a problem, but at least we, we wouldn't practically encounter such loops often because it turns out to get on them, you'd have to accelerate extraordinarily fast and we wouldn't have enough fuel. But from another, you know, so it's not a practical possibility, but it is a physical possibility in this sense. But I think, yeah, a lot of people think that there are various interesting senses in which it's possible. What do you think? I, I would like to, I think it's clearly possible in that sense, but it's not the interesting sense because I'm sort of saying somewhere in this infinite universe, there might be a loop, but you know, so fine. <laughs> I want to know if I can get on a loop, me personally. So I, I think the most interesting thing is the original H.G. Wells question. What does the saddle look like? What do the buttons do? And, and can I guarantee that you know, either for me or somebody I, I like or don't like, uh, they, they, get on this, they can get on this loop? And that's just, that turns out to be an open question. We have some results to suggest uh, it is possible there are always some weird things you introduce, though. Um, matter and energy behave in s strange ways in these universes. So you just have to, you have to ask what you're willing to stomach, I suppose. So the question on, on Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, which is the, we think of as a kind of Groundhog Day thing, is really not about the physics of it. Although, I, as I understand it, Nietzsche thought the physics w were correct, that if the universe is 
infinite and endless, I mean, if the universe is finite, it's going to come to an end and then everything will be over. But if it's infinite, it goes on forever, then every possible combination of every atom will work its way through and everything that happens will happen again and then will happen again an infinite number of times. But the point of that experiment, that thought experiment for Nietzsche is not thinking about the physics, it's thinking about how we would live in such a world. So he said when he first had that thought, he was cast into despair and thought, I'm trapped in this horrible prison where I'm going to do the same thing over and over again. But then he thought, no, this gives me the chance, as we all have the chance, he thinks, to affirm each moment that we live and to say, I don't care if we've done it an infinite number of times before and that I will do it an infinite number of times again in the future. I am, I will do it now. I choose to do it now. I'm happy to do it now. And if you can get into that mind space, says Nietzsche, then you free yourself. And that's quite powerful, I think. And it does, it, it deviates from physics as such, but it's, it's a very attractive idea. I'm not sure that, uh, for him, that becomes the definition of the Superman, though. The Superman is the, the, the overman, the, 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 the superior human version, is the person who can affirm that without feeling any sense of, oh, I'm trapped in a prison, I'm stuck here forever. So in a sense, Groundhog Day is, isn't a Nietzschean film because it's about how the character, the Bill Murray character, learns and becomes a better person. And when he becomes a good enough person, he's released from the loop and he can go on with his life. <laughs> That's not Nietzsche's point. Nietzsche's point is, no, you're stuck in that endless loop forever and ever and ever. You have to affirm it. You have to really take charge of it and live it. And that's you. And that's where we all are. Yeah, yeah I suppose there, there, are, there, there are at least these two different types of descriptions. The one in which it is a perfect closed loop. And then in a way you're saying by definition, you know, you're coming back to exactly the same thing again. Uh, and then there's a further idea that you're sort of going backwards in time and you might interact with your past self and then you head off and, and do another thing. Uh, there's lots of examples like this. You go and you, you have a limp. This is given by uh, Frank Artsanius. You have a limp and you really suffer from that limp. It's, hor it's been horrible pain most of your life. And so you go back in time and you want to kill yourself as a young person so that you don't, all the suffering doesn't happen in the world. You fire the gun but you miss and hit your younger self in the leg and the younger self develops this horrible limp and suffers <laughs> entirely. <laughs> So, and then you go off and do whatever you did. So this is a scenario where you're, you know, you're going back and visiting the other person. You're not sort of becoming them and you know, it's not a closed loop. It's rather mm. a, a, an interaction in the past and then you go on and do your, your business. Uh, so both these sorts of things, I guess, are possible. Nietzsche was concerned with the first one. I but actually thought it, 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 also, it also speaks to the Harry Potter question. And you're right, I mean, this, is, this is a fan theory. There's no shortage of those as far as Harry Potter's concerned, but it does identify something which seems to me quite important and which connects with what, we were, what I was saying earlier about death, how it's all to do with death. If we think about death, we think about us having some magic, privileged perspective on our own death. And that's not how it is. When we die, the perspective dies with us. And this idea that you can go back in time and you can see time again, but you will carry with you all the memories of the previous time is kind of like a version of that. So you go back and change history, and for everybody else, history just rolls on, as it always has and always will. But you have a memory of a different timeline, and you could do that any number of times, and you could carry all these different memories in your heads. It's a version of that same dream that we have, that we could step outside our mortal constraints and see things in a way that isn't, isn't determined by our own impending... Death, I'm sounding more Heideggerian. <laughs> you really Casual. are, yes. Yeah, quite, <laughs> so yeah. I want to it's close with a kind of quick fire question inspired by Emily's student interviewing techniques. So you've got <laughs> Who 40, should we shoot in the face? You've got 45 seconds each, maybe. <laughs> so that's you've, not the question. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to ask that. Uh, you've got 45 seconds, you've got the saddle, you've got the machine. What do you do? Time travel to the past. But to do what? You know, there's got to be something you want to find, something you want to see, someone you want to meet. Uh, I would, uh, <laughs> I think I would check what I can do and what I can't do. I'd learn a great deal about what's possible in physics. I would try and shoot people like crazy. I would just do everything that I can. <laughs> See if I could get my grandfather, you know. <laughs> because the constraints would tell you about the physics in an interesting way. A pr surprising massacre answer there. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, yourself? I, I really, I, the more I think about it, the more I think I would walk away from the machine. I don't see that there's any way it's going to end well. Whichever, whatever ideals you have, you're going to end up 
doing some terrible violation one way or the other. So. Apparently, even just the pursuit of physics knowledge draws oh, you to a very it. dangerous <laughs> place. <laughs> Emily, would you walk away? No, I would hop in and I would sail 3,000 years into the future, I think, in the hope of finding some sci-fi inspired space opera non-dystopia. <laughs> Well, what, what if it was just nuclear holocaust up there? What if I mean, that, that's going to be just a grey space and you have to live <laughs> yeah, exactly. for 3,000 years. So wait for history to catch up. Let's hope I've got some entertainment with yeah, me in the exactly. time machine. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, okay. Take a Sudoku with you. I thought we could end on that slightly dystopian slash <laughs> born out of utopian note. Okay, so it just remains to thank our speakers.